Hi and welcome to today's webcast with Rotteros. Today we have the CEO Lennart Ebele and the CFO Pia Olsson with us. If you have any questions for Lennart and Pia, you can ask them in a form that is located to the right. And with that said, I'll give you guys the stage. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Martin. And hello, everybody, to our quarter four report and full year report for 2021. It's a great pleasure for me to be here today and present uh, this very strong year end performance. And we are sending live from Bolnes and Helsingland and Karlstad and Värmland. And this is one of the good things that we will take with us from this pandemic, which officially is over in Sweden as of next week, February 9th. I hope you're all well and let's dive into the figures. If we look into the fourth quarter, we can see that we had a continued strong market that has supported our profits. We had an increase of 153 million versus last quarter of 2020. We have experienced, and that has been in the papers across Europe and probably all around the world, uh, an energy crisis, which has brought us very high electricity prices. Our measures we have in place have worked as planned and have safeguarded us from any results of those electricity prices that would have been negative. On the contrary, we had a very positive impact of our insurances. And we have also taken the next step for our packaging arm, where we are now since autumn have worked a lot with getting the technical development into place and signing the necessary agreements. So once the decisions have been taken, we will start exploring a new factory in Poland, which we are very excited for. Final decisions have to be taken, but they will be coming within the first half of this year. On the basis of our strong balance sheet and the strong cash position, the board also has proposed a dividend of 60 euro per share for the annual shareholders meeting, which will be held in April. Why should you invest in Rotten Roos and buy our share? Well, Rotten Roos is part of the circular economy. We do have a renewable and sustainable raw material, a growing forest, which despite that it is feeding the uh, forest industry is growing and accumulating carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere into the woodstock. We have proven that we have well-established niches and qualities that we supply to our customers who appreciate our qualities, where we create also additional value for them and that has safeguarded us during the last years and made us uh, exploring new fields of applications and growing in fields where there is a growth. And of course, we have been working very strong with safeguarding our balance sheet, generating a strong cash flow, make it possible to invest and upgrade our facilities, start building new businesses, as well as pay dividends to our shareholders. Looking into the market and what has happened on the pulp market since we talked last time, we see that the strong upward trend that we had in 2021 for the uh, long fiber sulfate craft pulp in Europe has come to a stop in October at $1,340 per ton. And then in November and December, we saw two consecutive months of declines of around $40. So beginning of January, we were at $1,260. If we would be looking back in history, we would have expected this trend to continue, but uh, that has not been the case. Uh, supply chain issues and the good underlying demand in certain areas has uh, made that this development came to stop in January. January prices were unchanged versus December. And we are now in February already experiencing a new increase to $1,300. And there are increases out in the market uh, pushing the prices to 1350 The green line is the uh, list price in Swedish kroner. So there you see the effect of uh, the currency differences between the dollar and the Swedish kroner. 
These are the average prices on a quarterly basis. And if we look on the next slide, which you by now are probably familiar with, we see the monthly prices and there's a little bit of a steeper drop down to 1,260 at the end of December. And the bars uh, you see here also indicating the stock levels or pulp reports. And uh, you see that they have come down since the peak in 2019 that has uh, driven up the prices during last year. And they're now back on a level which is within the normal variation to a uh, normal balance between output and demand. Um, now, if we allow some comments on, on why the situation is rather unusual, as I've mentioned, we have experienced logistics issues, uh, supply chain issues around the world, which have made that pulp has ended up in the wrong places where it's not really needed and cannot come to where it is needed with the paper makers. Uh, supply chain issues also have made it uh, very difficult for Chinese uh, paper and board producers to export their goods. Uh, there had been a steady historical flow from China into Europe of uh, paper and board, and that has dried up during last year. So our customers in Europe, and Europe is our major market, around 70% of our sales are in Europe, have experienced a very strong market and still are experiencing a strong market. And on the back of that, we have seen pulp prices coming up and uh, probably stabilizing at a relatively high level. So let's see how things go forward. But I mentioned Europe to be our major market. And just a brief overview here. Uh, these are the various uh, paper and board qualities that are adding up to some 85 million tons in the market. And you see that the graphical paper and newsprint segment is now accounting for some 26%. That is a, a continued decline, and we have heard about machine closures during the course of the last years, and uh, that is an effect and result of a shift from printed media into digital media. On the other hand, packaging is growing, and the uh, container board, board and paper now is more than half of all the fiber uh, consumption. Uh, this is both integrated pulp and paper mills as well as uh, non-integrated ones, those who are buying their pulp from us and our competitors. Tissue still a relatively small market, but uh, in tissue is the largest growth over time. If we look at these various segments and their development during last year, uh, there had been a rebound for uh, printing and writing papers. There had been a strong press at the beginning of the pandemic in 2020. We saw declines of up to 20%. And that has been rebounded and uh, had some strong demand. And that we have has been reflected in our customers' demands as well. Um, but I think underlying, we will see a continued decline of these uh, paper grades. Container board, on the other hand, continued to be strong, driven by e-commerce and uh, continued good demand for products that need to be packed. How is that then translated into the pulp market on a global basis? We see that uh, January through November last year, Europe had been a good market. We've seen that, we've seen our prices coming up during 2021. On the other hand, China had a very weak market. So globally demand for pulp was negative. Um, an exception to this is the UKP, the unbleached craft pulp, a speciality which we amongst others are producing. And there we had a, seen a growth of more than 20% during the course of the year. It's a small segment, but it's a very important segment uh, for us. And if we look at how our supplies have been during the course of the year. You see that our board and packaging applications have grown. This is our customers consuming our pulp for their board making. Uh, and then filters where porosity is an important uh, property of our pulp is the second largest. Printing and writing has uh, decreased now to under 20%. And uh, I think that will be a continued trend going forward, also looking at how the various applications have developed on the previous slides. So it's a very well-balanced uh, 
development and uh, also a balanced market and customer portfolio that is leveling out uh, the different variations that can be experienced over time. With that, we have a look into, look into the quarter four results and I leave it over to Pia. Please, Pia. Thank you. I'm very happy to present the very strong year-end performance for you. And I will start off with doing a comparison on EBIT uh, on quarter four 2021 versus quarter four 2020. And what is driving profitability? Firstly, as Lennart commented, we had an increase in the EBIT of 153 million sec. And as you can see on the dark blue bar, we have the price and currency that is the major part of that. And uh, during the quarter, we had an increase of the NBSK in US dollars of 53%. And uh, actually the dollar had uh, a bit of a currency upwards um, uh, of 3% that also contributed to the EBIT. And if we look at the volume, we also had a positive contribution, even though we made less ton, we had a favorable mix that actually improved the EBIT. Uh, if we take a look at the, the light green bar, the variable cost, it is actually so that Lena told us that the electricity hedging was actually impacting positively on the electricity prices in the quarter four versus 2020. And we actually made, uh, we had 20 million less electricity cost, but we saw an increase in the variable cost on fuel, on chemicals and on wood. So that total impact was a minus versus 2020. Also on the fixed cost, we had higher personnel cost and planned maintenance costs that actually uh, contributed negative. And if we take a closer look into the volatil volatility in the electricity price market, we here see a graph that shows us the development from January 2016 up until December 2021. And the Light green line is describing the price area SE3, where we have most of our consumption, nearly 90% is consumed by the mill in Rottneros. And the dark blue line is the system price. And we can see that those lines are actually deviating during the end of the year. And that actually made us stop the mill in um, uh, Rotneros for and we lost about 7,000 tons in quarter four due to high electricity prices. Though we had well functioning hedges and we actually had lower electricity cost during quarter four. And also during 2021, we had a positive effect on the hedges of 113 million sec and we had lower electricity prices year on year on 35 million sec. So let's take a look at the EBIT for the whole year. And here we can see that we have a, a major change is 309 million sec um, uh, increase in EBIT versus 2020. And likewise, as in quarter four, we actually have the price and currency that is driving the EBIT. We had a change in the NBSK of 42% 2021 versus 2020, but we had a weaker US dollar that affected it, the EBIT negative, and that was minus 7%. If we take a look at the volume, you see here that we have a negative trend on the volume and we have identified the problems. We have taken actions to drive our continuous improvement and we are improving our capacity utilization. Um, if we look at the variable cost, uh, the first three quarters of uh, 2021 was actually good ones uh, in terms of EBIT 
And then in quarter four, something happened and the costs were, were actually higher as I described on the quarter comparison. And here we see the same negative effect on the fixed cost as in the quarter comparison. So I will talk a little bit more about the profit development year on year. Here we see that uh, compared to quarter four 2020, we have positive uh, quarters for the whole of 2021. And um, that is taking us to the financing side. What has happened there? Well, we have been doing some new financing. We had the early redemption of our bond loan on 400 million sec in quarter three. And we took up a new loan facility of 100 million sec plus a revolving credit of 150 million sec. And that will give us lower financing costs in the future. And if we see um, the effect on our balance sheet by just this new financing, we can see here in the light green bar in quarter four for 2021, we actually have a positive net debt and we haven't had that since 2016. So a strong development on the, the net debt. And also we can see the cash flow and the cash flow is strong. And even though that we had paid in dividend in September and we have been investing 125 million sec, we ended the year of a equity ratio of 64% and our target is over 50%. So uh, efficient and solid balance sheet. And with that, I will give the word back to Lennart. Thank you very much, Pia. And uh, let's have a little bit of a look ahead and what's uh, driving demand for pulp and especially our own uh, qualities. <clears throat> Tissue is a strong segment. Uh, based on uh, larger disposable incomes, better living standards, <coughs> and a growing population. This is mainly driving consumption of eucalyptus, and in eucalyptus it is that short fiber, mainly from Latin America, where new capacities added, and that mainly finds its way in, in, into tissue. But uh, for higher qualities and kitchen towels, there is a good demand for long fiber, which we produce, as well as when it comes to absorption, where our mechanical pulps play a vital role. E-commerce is driving uh, the demand for paper-based and fiber-based packaging materials. We've seen that not the least during the last two years, but overall in general, there's a strong trend <coughs> towards more ordering through the internet and having things shipped home. And as there is a squeeze on fibers, and there's less recycled fibers available. This is also driving the demand for better and uh, more well-functioning primary fibers, uh, which you can easily blend into the furnish on your otherwise secondary fiber-based uh, paper machine. So here we see, as not the least for UKP, a good market going ahead. And recycled fibers and recycled-based board prices have seen a, a strong uptake during the last half year. We're also aware of that there is a lot going on in the electricity sector. Uh, the EU taxonomy and also the need to replace fossil based energy sources with renewable based energy sources, which leads to more transportable or, or transferring cables, more cables, more transformators. And both cables and transformators actually have a need for very pure brown fibers with a very low or no conductivity. And here, Rotnerves is one of the uh, most suited suppliers into the segment. And, and we have seen a strong pickup during the last year and believe also going forward that will be a strong demand as this transition is by far not over at all. Sustainability is a segment that is driving the entire forest industry forward. Um, and uh, not the least, we ourselves here are trying to lock into this trend with our molded fiber packaging that we have been working on for the last uh, 15 years. And here I can have just some more words on when we are standing. In the autumn of last year, we signed a letter of intent, uh, as I've said 
initially we have been working on that, bringing that forward and pre preparing the, the necessary decisions to be taken that will uh, establish a factory in Poland of a capacity of around 80 million trays of very high quality. We're not talking about the um, usual salad bowl or uh, single-used uh, tableware. These are, as you can see in the picture, high quality trays which enable a modified atmosphere inside the pack. So you can have a ready-made prepared meal uh, to be stored in a cool chain, not a frozen chain, but a cool chain for up to three weeks. And as far as we know, and we have done intensive and extensive market research, we haven't seen anybody else who is doing this at this point. Uh, we do have a, an existing uh, market <laughs> and, and customer. Uh, so we have served more than uh, 3 million lunches together with our customer of these kind of packaging. So uh, this gives us a strong confidence that the technology we have developed and that we are all safeguarding through patents will be a very good basis for taking the next step for packaging and start ramping up capacity in cooperation with Arctic Paper where we f see a very good um, fit as it is an existing paper mill with pulping capacity, infrastructure such as uh, wastewater treatment and energy supply. So if we summarize the quarter four and the full year of 2021, we have seen a very strong pulp market and it has come to slight stop at the end of the year, but it's picking up again beginning this year. That has led to a strong result development. We have maintained a strong cash flow. We already paid a dividend uh, during the end of 2021 and the board is now preparing, uh, pr proposing a new dividend for the um, shareholder meeting later on the spring. And we are close of taking the next step for packaging. With that, I thank you for your patience and we are now opening up for questions. So back to you, Martin. Thank you very much, Lanat and Pia, for that presentation. And like I said, now it's time for the Q&A. Uh, moving on to the first question. Uh, how do you anticipate pull prices to behave in 2022? I will take that. Um, it's always difficult. We always try to rely on the um, future prognose makers who are around uh, and supporting this industry. Uh, it's not always they are uh, taking <laughs> the right approach or, or finding the right figures um, and it's difficult to look far ahead. But what we've seen is that the pulp markets have diverged. Instead of one global market, uh, we've seen that uh, China, Europe and the US or North America have behaved differently. They're more isolated. And uh, the strong market in Europe we've seen during the last year and the week Chinese market have been sort of decoupled. Um, this, this is a result of uh, supply chain interruptions and they are ongoing and I think it will take some time before those uh, things are back in harmony and uh, very well and fully functioning. So at least for the first half of this year, 2022, I, I am optimistic on uh, where, where the balance is, that is, there is a good balance. Um, what that means exactly in prices, I, I don't dare to have a guess on. Perfect, thank you for that answer. And moving on to the next question, uh, looking ahead into 2022, is there something that you are excited about or looking forward to? Uh, in 2022, I'm definitely very exciting about the hopefully hopeful decisions that we'll be taking around packaging. We've been working with that very long time for the last 15 years and during the last four years we have taken very strong step forward. We have um, built up an organization which is highly motivated and competent. We've found a good partner and perfect fit. So that is, uh, that is probably one of the most exciting things uh, looking forward into 2022. Um, I'm also very confident that although we have a global energy crisis, 
we are very well situated with our electricity hedges. I mean, they're stretching out up until 2025. This year, we have 91% of our needs hedged. Next year, 100%. The year after that, in 24, 87%. And when the prices are right, and, and the long uh, forward curve always is not that uh, incredible high as the short-term prices, we will continue to build onto those uh, head hedges. And we are looking also into other means of complementing our financial instruments with more physical instruments, such as long-term agreements and uh, PPAs, power purchase agreements, where we will support uh, the startup of renewable energy projects such as uh, wind power and solar power. And, and there is a strong development in that market, and I think uh, 2021 and 2022 are a tipping point here where we'll see a lot of those things happening, and uh, we are well positioned to participate in that. And we do have the time frame to allow us to do that in a professional and uh, professional manner as we have those hedges in place. Perfect. Thank you for that answer. We'll take the next question. Uh, the balance sheet is strong. Do you, have, do you have some plans for new projects in addition to the packaging project with Arctic Paper or acquisitions going forward? On that page, we are certainly a bit more opportunistic. Um, it, it's not the large acquisitions that you are used to from the forest industry. We're by far much too small player for that. We've successfully backwards integrated with Newquist Skoog two years ago, and that has brought a lot of value into our sourcing operations. As you self mentioned, uh, packaging will be our main focus. We're also a relatively small organization, so we cannot be focusing on too many things at the same time. But we're always open and we're following what happens. And uh, if the opportunity arises, we will certainly uh, try to make the most use of the cash position that we have. And uh, we also demonstrated that we were able to uh, take a, a bond loan in 2017 for, for a figure of 600 million. We only utilized 400, but the total frame was 600 million. And that sort of uh, is enabling us the position and the possibility to, to do interesting moves when they come around. Perfect. Thank you for that answer. And we'll take the next question. Uh, where do you see discounts going forward for your qualities? Well, I don't think I can comment that. Uh, in general, there is a regular inflation in discounts. Uh, this question obviously is related to the NBSK list price. The list price is um, traded with a discount uh, where those discounts are, are highly different between grades and qualities. With our niche position, we have lower than market average rebates. Uh, that is what I can say at this point. Um, and we try to find this, fight this inflation by developing our customer offerings over time. Okay, we'll take the next question. Uh, do you have any color on strategy regarding energy? Yes, uh, we do. Energy is uh, highly important for us. Uh, we are a large con consumer. We consume some 280 to 300 gigawatt hours. Um, so, it is important not to only rely on our hedges, uh, but also to work with energy efficiency investments and measurements. We have certified energy management uh, systems in place. Energy is always part of our investments. Uh, how can investment lead to an reduced energy consumption? Uh, those are the things we control ourselves. And as I've said, there are a lot of opportunities um, to develop renewable energy projects, not by us financing them, but uh, by us giving those projects a 10 or 15 year contract so that they have the um, security of uh, a uh, takeoff and that enables those projects to get uh, favorable financing. Uh, so I, I believe those measures will help mitigate uh, energy fluctuation uh, going forward. Okay, we'll take the last question here. Uh, can you comment on how your process is going of having a fossil-free production by 2030? 
we are in the um, investigation and uh, project phase. So we are looking into what are the largest sources for uh, our fossil fuel needs and how can we change those uh, fossil fuels with uh, bio-based fuels. Uh, we're making good progress. Uh, we have a list of things that need to be done. We are now in 2022. I think we will see uh, some projects materializing during the course of this year and next year. So by 2025 already, we will see some uh, measurable reductions of uh, fossil fuel and it's already a very low amount um, if you look at our total energy some consumption more than 80 percent of the energy we consume is uh, biomass uh, based so here forest industry in general already is uh, far ahead of many other industries which is one of the things why i feel proud and uh, working for the forest industry it's uh, a lot of hope for the future that we have Okay, thank you very much Lennart and Pia for presenting today and answering our questions. And also a big thank you to all of you who have uh, viewed today's uh, webcast. And I hope you have a great day. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.